Hi, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome. I am going to give you some instructions and explain to you how the case will proceed. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have been selected as the jury in this case. As you know, this is a criminal case. And to assist you in better understanding your functions and duties, I will tell you now how the case will proceed. You are, as I said in my earlier comments during the initial phase, you are the sole judges of the facts. Your determination of the facts is to be based solely upon the evidence submitted during the course of the trial. When I use the term evidence, I mean the testimony of witnesses who will testify and any exhibits which may be marked into evidence and which will then be taken into the jury room for your review at the end of the case. Please bear in mind some items are marked during the course of the trial as exhibits but are either not formally moved into evidence by counsel or not accepted into the court as evidence. So if an item is marked as an exhibit and not moved into evidence, you will not have access to that. For instance, there may be police reports that commonly are not admitted into evidence, but they may be used to refresh a witness's recollection while testifying. That's permissible. That report has to be marked so the record can reflect what report uh, the attorney may be referring to and what was used to refresh the witness's recollection. So that report will be marked as an exhibit, say, exhibit S number 12 or D number 10. But that um, likely will not be moved or accepted into evidence by the court. That's only an exhibit. All right? It's only items that are accepted, formally moved into evidence and accepted by the court as evidence that you will have in the jury room. <clears throat> The first order of business will be the prosecutor's opening statement. In the opening statement, the prosecutor will present the state's contentions and will outline what he expects to prove. Following that, the defendant, if he chooses, will make an opening statement through counsel. What is said in the opening statement is not evidence. The evidence will come from the witnesses who will testify and from whatever documents or tangible items are received in the evidence. During the trial, the attorneys may make objections as evidence is offered, where they may address certain motions to make. They have a right and indeed a duty to make objections and motions when it seems to them to be proper to do so. I have a duty to rule upon any objections and motions based on the law. If you hear me say an objection is overruled, that means I am ruling against the attorney making the objection. If I say an objection is sustained, I am ruling in favor of the attorney making the objection. Anything excluded by me is not evidence and must not be considered by you in your deliberations. Sometimes these evidence questions or legal questions will be heard in your presence in open court, other times at sidebar, or you may be excused and go into the jury room so that we can discuss that in open court. But I've made clear to the attorneys, because of the anticipated length of that trial, I will keep those at a minimum. The attorneys will be here early, and they'll stay late, and if there are motions or issues that come up during the trial, we'll try to handle them before you're brought into the court, uh, courtroom or after you leave to keep the inconvenience at a minimum. I do realize that being confined uh, in the jury room, although it's much bigger in the courtroom than our traditional jury room, is not pleasant, but I do, if it does happen, I ask your patience and your indulgence. You should not conclude, because I rule one way or the other on objections or motions, that I have any feelings about the outcome of the case. I do not. But even if I did, you would have to disregard them, since you are the sole judges of the facts. During the trial from time to time, there will be recesses, and during any of those recesses, I direct you, please, do not discuss the case among yourselves, and when we recess overnight, you must not discuss the case or the testimony with any family members or any other persons or provide an account of your jury service to others, including through any electronic means, including social media. For example, 
Please do not talk face to face or use any electronic devices or any means, computer, cell phone, or similar device to communicate to anyone any information about this case. Also, please do not post any information on social media about the case. The reason, of course, is that you should not begin any deliberations until the entire case has been concluded. That is, you have heard all of the witnesses, the final arguments of counsel, as well as my instructions as to the law. It would be improper for any outside influences to intrude upon your thinking. If anyone should attempt to discuss the case with you, you should report the fact to me or my staff immediately and I will take any necessary corrective actions. If you have a cell phone or any device that is capable of providing internet access and any device that may be used to record or transmit sound or images, you must turn off that device while in the courtroom. Similarly, you must turn off these communication devices and cannot use them for any purposes while in the jury deliberation room. Please be mindful of these instructions. During jury selection, you were asked and responded to a series of questions from the court. If at any time during this trial you realize that you may have made a misstatement or omission during your responses, or if circumstances arise that could change or alter the answers you gave, please do not discuss that with any fellow jurors. Rather, you should tell the court officer or my staff who will notify me at once. <clears throat> During the trial, you are not to speak to or associated with any of the attorneys, the witnesses, or the defendant, nor are they permitted to speak or associate with you. This separation should not be regarded as rudeness, but rather as a proper precaution to ensure fairness to both sides. If anyone connected with this case or any other person approaches you or attempts to influence you in any way, please do not discuss that fact with any of your fellow jurors. Again, simply tell the sheriff's officer or a member of my staff. They will notify me immediately and I will take the necessary corrective action. Your deliberations in this case must be based solely on the evidence and exhibits admitted into evidence without any outside influence or opinions of relatives or friends. Additionally, do not read any news stories or articles in print or on the internet or in any blog about this case. There will likely be media coverage of this trial, but you are instructed to completely avoid reading, viewing, or listening to any newspaper or media accounts or listening to anyone else discuss them. And you will notice that there are cameras set up in the courtroom. So, that's why I say I know there will be media coverage. Please do not pay attention to any of the cameras. Any media have been instructed under the penalty of contempt of court that they cannot at any time record your images or your names or any information about you. During the jury selection process we just had, the cameras were turned off. They were not recording any aspect of jury selection. And they have signed court orders indicating that they know under penalty that they cannot record images or names of any of the jurors. Additionally, I must instruct you not to read any newspaper articles or search for or research any information related to this case including anything about the participants in the trial, such as the parties, the witnesses, when they testify, the lawyers, of course, or the judge, for that matter, or any court personnel. The strict prohibition against outside research or communication applies not only to printed reference materials, but also, obviously, to the Internet or any other electronic medium. You are not to seek any additional information on the subject matter of this case, the laws in any way related to this case or any other factual or legal matter that may have a connection to this case. Additionally, please do not visit or view any place discussed during testimony by way of Internet Maps or Google Earth or other similar programs. And I'm sure you can understand why this instruction is so important. Information from sources outside of the courtroom is not evidence is often based upon second or third-hand information, is hearsay, 
and is not always accurate, and certainly is not subject to examination by the attorneys. A juror's improper use of outside technology threatens the very fairness of our system of justice and could result in the court having to start the trial anew, wasting the court's time and the party's time as well as your valuable time. In the event such outside information does come to your attention, again, please do not discuss that fact with any of your fellow jurors. It is important that you tell a member of my staff or a sheriff's officer, they'll inform me and then I can determine whether there's any corrective action that needs to take place to ensure the fairness of this trial. <clears throat> the court and the parties rely upon your good faith and the fact that you have been sworn to comply with the instructions of the court so that both sides may receive a fair trial. Because this instruction is important, it is my duty to remind you of it at the end of each day's proceedings. Since you are the sole judges of the facts, you must pay close attention during the testimony. It is important that you carry with you to the jury room not only a clear recollection of what the testimony was, but also a recollection of the manner in which it was given. It will be your duty to pay careful attention to all of the testimony. If you are unable to hear any witness, I ask that you indicate to me uh, that to me immediately by raising your hand, and I will instruct the witness to speak loud or uh, louder or more clearly. As jurors, you will be required to pass upon all of the questions of fact, including the credibility or believability of the witnesses. Your verdict must be based, again, solely on the evidence introduced in the courtroom. Jurors are not permitted to take notes. Experience has shown that note-taking is distracting. It is better to depend upon the combined recollection of all of the jurors than upon notes taken by one or more of them. At the conclusion of the testimony, the attorneys will speak to you again in summation. At that time, they will present to you their final arguments based upon their respective recollections of the evidence. Again, what the attorneys say to you in summation is not evidence. It's their recollection of the evidence and arguments regarding the interpretation of the evidence. However, it is always your recollection as the jurors that is controlling. Following summations, you will receive your final instructions on the law from me, and you will then retire to the jury room to consider your verdict. You are not to form or express an opinion on this case, but are to keep an open mind until you have heard all of the testimony and have heard summations and have had the benefit of my instructions as to the applicable law and have been instructed by the court to begin your deliberations. It is your duty to weigh the evidence calmly and without bias, passion, prejudice, or sympathy, and to decide the issues only upon the merits. You as jurors should find your facts from the evidence adduced during the trial. Evidence may be either direct or circumstantial. Direct evidence means evidence that directly proves a fact without an inference, and which in itself, if true, conclusively establishes that fact. On the other hand, circumstantial evidence means evidence that proves a fact from which an inference of the existence of another fact may be shown or drawn. An inference is a deduction of fact that may logically and reasonably be drawn from another fact or group of facts established by the evidence. It is not necessary that facts be proved by direct evidence. They may be proved by direct evidence or circumstantial evidence or a combination of direct and circumstantial evidence. Both direct and circumstantial evidence are acceptable as means of proof. Indeed, in many cases, circumstantial evidence may be more certain, satisfying, and persuasive than direct evidence. In any event, both circumstantial and direct evidence should be scrutinized and evaluated carefully. A conviction may be based on direct evidence alone, circumstantial evidence alone, or a combination of direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. 
provided, of course, that it convinces you of a defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> Conversely, if direct or circumstantial evidence gives rise to a reasonable doubt in your minds as to the defendant's guilt, then the defendant must be found not guilty. A simple illustration may be helpful. We'll say that the problem is proving that it snowed during the night. Direct evidence of that fact would be testimony from a witness indicating that the witness observed snow falling during the night. So I, I had young children, well not that young, teenagers, but they still like getting off from school during the winter time when it snows. And if there's snow in the forecast, invariably my children before going to bed and retiring look out the window to see if it's snowing. And if they see snow falling at that time and they came in and said, Dad, it's snowing, that would be direct evidence, direct testimony that it was in fact snowing at night. Now circumstantial evidence <clears throat> is testimony indicating there was no snow on the ground before the witness went to sleep and that when he or she arose in the morning it was not snowing but the ground was snow covered. So in that scenario I gave you, if my children looked out the window at night and there was a forecast for snow but there was no snow on the ground there was no snow falling, and they were tired to bed, but when they woke up in the morning and they saw snow blanketing the ground, they didn't see it snow, but from the fact that there's snow on the ground, they would draw a reasonable, logical inference that it had, in fact, snowed during the night. So they're drawing an inference from a fact established, snow on the ground, that it had snowed during the night. That would be an example of circumstantial evidence. The former direct evidence directly goes to prove the fact that snow fell during the night while the latter establishes facts from which the inference that it snowed during the night can be drawn. As the judges of the facts, you ought to determine the credibility of the witnesses and in determining whether a witness is worthy of belief and therefore credible, you may take into consideration the following. The appearance and demeanor of the witness the manner in which he or she may testify, the witness's interest in the outcome of the trial, if any, his or her means of obtaining knowledge of the facts, the witness's power of discernment, meaning their judgment, their understanding, his or her ability to reason, observe, recollect, and relate, the possible bias, if any, in favor of the side for whom the witness testifies, the extent to which, if at all, each witness is either corroborated or contradicted, supported or discredited by the other evidence. Whether the witness testified with an intent to deceive you, the reasonableness or unreasonableness of the testimony the witness has given. Whether the witness made any inconsistent or contradictory statements and any and all other matters, any evidence, would serve to support or discredit his or her testimony to you. During deliberations, you may ask, what is more reasonable, the more probable, the more logical version? Inconsistencies or discrepancies in the testimony of a witness or between the testimony of different witnesses may or may not cause you to discredit such testimony. Two or more persons witnessing an incident may see or hear it differently. An innocent misrecollection, like failure of recollection, is not an uncommon experience in weighing the effect of a discrepancy. Consider whether the discrepancy pertains to a matter of importance or an or willful falsehood. As a general rule, witnesses can testify only as to facts known by them. This rule ordinarily does not permit the opinion of a witness to be received as evidence. However, an exception to this rule exists in the case of an expert witness who may give his or her opinion as to any matter in which he or she is versed and which is material to the case. 
In legal terminology, an expert witness is a witness who has some special knowledge, skill, experience, or training that is not possessed by the ordinary juror and who thus may be able to provide assistance to the jury in understanding the evidence presented and determine the facts in this case. In this case, as you recall from the voir dire questions, there may be expert witnesses called by either the state or the defense. Please bear in mind that you are not bound by such experts' opinion, but you should consider each opinion and give it the weight to you which to uh, which you deem it is entitled, whether that be great or slight, or you may reject it. In examining each opinion, you may consider the reasons for giving it, if any, and you may also consider the qualifications and credibility of the expert. It is always within the special function of the jury to determine whether the facts on which the answer or testimony of an expert is based actually exist. The value or weight of the opinion of the expert is dependent upon and is no stronger than the facts on which it is based. In other words, the probative value of the opinion will depend upon whether from all of the evidence in the case you find that those facts are true. You may in fact determine from the evidence in this case that the facts that form the basis of the opinion are true or not true or are true in part only. And in light of such findings, you should decide what effect such determination has upon the weight to be given to the opinion of the expert. Your acceptance or rejection of the expert opinion will depend, therefore, to some extent on your findings as to the truth of the facts relied upon. The ultimate determination of whether or not the state has proven the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt is to be made only by the jury. The defendant Michael Barrison stands before you on an indictment found by the grand jury charging him with committing the crimes of attempted murder of Lauren Cataract, that's count one. Count two charges the attempted murder of Robert Goodwin. Count three charges possession of a weapon, a handgun for an unlawful purpose. Count four charges possession of a weapon, a handgun for an unlawful purpose. The indictment is not evidence of the defendant's guilt on the charges. An indictment is a step in the procedure to bring the matter before the court and jury for the jury's ultimate determination as to whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty on the charges stated in it. The defendant has pleaded not guilty to the charges. The defendant on trial is presumed to be innocent and unless each and every essential element of the offenses charged or proved beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant must be found not guilty on that charge. The burden of proving each element of the charges beyond a reasonable doubt rests upon the state, and that burden never shifts to the defendant. It is not the obligation or the duty of the defendant in a criminal case to prove his innocence or offer any proof relating to his innocence. The prosecution must prove its case by more than a mere preponderance of the evidence, yet not necessarily to an absolute certainty. The state has the burden of proving a defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Some of you may have served as jurors in civil cases where you were told that it is necessary to prove only that a fact is more likely true than not true. In criminal cases, the state's proof must be more powerful than that. It must be beyond a reasonable doubt. A reasonable doubt is an honest and reasonable uncertainty in your minds about the guilt of the defendant <clears throat> after you have given full and impartial consideration to all of the evidence. A reasonable doubt may arise from the evidence itself or from a lack of evidence. It is a doubt that a reasonable person hearing the same evidence would have. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof, for example, that leaves you firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt. In this world, we know very few things with absolute certainty. In criminal cases, the law does not require proof that overcomes every possible doubt. If, based on your consideration of the evidence, you are firmly convinced of the defendant, 
guilt of the crime charge, you must find him guilty. If, on the other hand, you are not firmly convinced of the defendant's guilt, you must give the defendant the benefit of the doubt and find him not guilty. You will note that a jury of 16 has been drawn in this case at the conclusion of the evidence and at the conclusion of the charge by the court, there will be a random selection in which four jurors will act as alternate jurors. The 12 remaining jurors will then deliberate and return a verdict. At this point, we don't know who the alternate jurors will be, whether or not their services will be utilized. Thus, I direct that all jurors pay equal attention to the evidence as it is presented and to the court's rulings, which are applicable to the case. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, that completes my initial instructions to the court. We're ready to uh, begin now with the opening statements. We'll hear. Yes, Ms. Kupka. I'm sorry, Judge. Um, I believe that the, uh, the state's detective needs to bring in some evidence for opening statements. All right. You know what we're going to do? It's almost 11 o'clock. We're going to take a short recess, and then we'll hear both opening statements. And depending on where we stand, we may begin with the witness or we may break for lunch. But why don't we take just a 10-minute recess, we'll get set up for openings, and then you'll hear from the state first and then uh, the defense if they wish to give an opening. All right? Thank you. Thank you.